When you're a parent, most parents anyway, all you want is the best for your child. In this highly disturbing case that we're about to dig into, I do believe that was the case. However, it all went horribly wrong. But first, I'm Vanessa and welcome to Unmasked. Please help support the channel by hitting the subscribe, the thumbs up, the notification bell and setting to all so you'll be notified of all of my upcoming videos. The case I'm about to show you is infamous for several reasons. One of those reasons being the absolutely chilling police interviews that you're about to watch. So sit back and get comfy as I tell you all about Jennifer's Revenge. Jennifer Pan was born on June 17, 1986 in Canada to her parents Han and Bic Pan. Her brother Felix came into the world three years later. Her parents Han and Bic Pan were both refugees that immigrated to Canada from Vietnam. Han came over to Canada in 1979 and Bic came over separately. They married in Toronto and both got jobs at an auto parts manufacturing plant, Magna International. Han was a tool and die maker and Bic made car parts. They saved their money and by 2004 were able to buy a very nice house with a two-car garage nestled in a quiet suburban area. Han put a lot of importance in image and was very proud of his Mercedes-Benz and Bic's Lexus ES300. They had also accumulated a substantial nest egg in savings. Han and Bic were both classic tiger parents. Tiger parenting refers to a strict authoritarian method of parenting that's intent is to raise high achieving children. This often means that the kids are not allowed to participate in common social activities like sleepovers, parties, dances, dating, and other fun activities. Those types of leisurely activities are looked at as distractions from their studies. Parents who practice tiger parenting methods believe that their strict parenting methods benefit their children by setting them up to succeed in the future. In addition, adults who use tiger parenting strategies feel that by setting a higher bar, they are instilling a strong work ethic in their children. However, there are many critics of this method. The concept of tiger parenting may be well-intentioned by loving and protective parents, but research has indicated that this stringent method of raising kids can elicit the exact opposite outcome of what's intended. A 2013 study found children whose parents practiced tiger parenting strategies were no more likely to achieve academic success than their peers whose parents used other methods. This study also determined that these children were more likely to be psychologically maladjusted with an increased risk of anxiety and depression. Han and Bic were strong believers in this parenting method and they placed incredibly high demands on both Jennifer and her brother Felix. They felt that they led by example with all of their hard work and that Felix and Jennifer needed to be prepared for when they passed the torch. The Pans put Jennifer in piano lessons starting at four years old. As a child, Jennifer won quite a few trophies due to her musical talent. Jennifer did excel in music and in ice skating. Her parents had dreams of her going on to compete in the Olympics. There were many nights when Jennifer was at practice until 10 p.m. and then came home to hours of homework. That was the period when it first became evident that something might be wrong. Jennifer began cleaning herself and putting on what she referred to as her quote, happy mask. Unfortunately, due to a knee injury, Jennifer and her parents had to give up any dreams of competing in the Olympics. The injury prevented her from going any further and caused her to have to give up her favorite sport. 
Jennifer went to high school at Mary Ward Catholic Secondary in Scarborough. She played the flute in the school band, swam, and also practiced martial arts. She was always very friendly at school and interacted with the other students. Han wanted Jennifer to become a doctor. However, the problem was that not only did Jennifer not have any interest in medicine, but she was just not that academically gifted. In fact, once she hit high school, she struggled just to pass her classes and her grades were mostly low C's. Knowing that this was completely unacceptable to her parents, she did master forging documents from a very young age. She altered her report cards to reflect all A's before bringing them home to Han and Bick. Jennifer was forbidden to go to any parties or school dances. Han viewed them as a waste of time. All of her comings and goings were monitored 24-7. Classmates later recalled that her parents were extremely controlling, and if she did get to spend a night out at a friend's house, they would drop her off late and pick her up very early. Han was definitely the stricter parent. Bick was much softer, and sensing that Jennifer was under a lot of stress, she would come to her at night when Han was asleep and try to talk to her. However, Bick would ultimately bend to her husband's wishes. In 2003, when Jennifer was in 11th grade, she met senior Daniel Wong. Daniel played the trumpet in the school band. They went on a band trip together in Europe, and during that trip, Jennifer suffered a severe asthma attack due to the heavy smoke in the auditorium. She later recalled that Daniel helped her calm down and regulate her breathing. She basically credited him with saving her life. They began dating the following summer. This presented yet another challenge for Jennifer, as having a boyfriend was strictly forbidden until after college. Daniel transferred to a different school due to his poor grades, but still came to visit Jennifer. Jennifer would also skip school to go visit him, which didn't help her already suffering grades. Daniel had also been in some trouble with the law for selling drugs. When it came time to graduate from high school, Jennifer had a huge problem. Her parents thought she was getting ready to graduate and head off to Ryerson, where she had received an early acceptance. In reality, Jennifer had failed a calculus class and her acceptance to the university was subsequently revoked. In addition to the revocation of her acceptance, she wasn't even eligible to graduate from high school. Their beloved Jennifer was now a high school dropout, and Jennifer knew that this would be completely unacceptable and that she would have to keep up the facade all the way through college. Since Han knew that Jennifer didn't want to be a doctor, he told her that he wanted her to become a pharmacist. Jennifer told her parents that she planned on going to Ryerson for the first two years and then would transfer over to the University of Toronto's pharmacology program. Her parents were thrilled. Jennifer knew she had to sell this lie and pretended to receive scholarships and even went as far as buying the textbooks so that everything would look legit. In the mornings, she would take the bus downtown pretending to go to class. She even researched the topic she was supposed to be studying and took large amounts of fake notes to show her parents. When she left the house, she would go visit Daniel and eventually worked as a server at a restaurant and taught piano lessons. In 2006, right on schedule, Jennifer told her parents that she was transferring over to the University of Toronto as she had been accepted into their pharmacology program. She told her parents that she wanted to move in with her friend Topaz three nights a week to avoid the long commute. Her mother was able to convince Han to let her stay there part-time. In reality, Jennifer was living with her boyfriend Daniel those three days a week. When Daniel's parents asked Jennifer if her parents were okay with her living there, she lied and said yes. When she was supposed to be graduating in 2008, Jennifer told her parents that she had a huge graduating class, so the university was only giving out one ticket per student to attend the graduation ceremony. She explained that she had given her ticket to a friend so that she wouldn't have to exclude either parent. Jennifer and Daniel hired someone online to create a fake college transcript of all A's. Jennifer told her parents that she was volunteering at a blood testing lab at a hospital called Sick Kids. Han and Bick started to become suspicious when they saw that she didn't have a new uniform or a badge for her new job. To make sure that Jennifer was being honest, Han insisted they drive her to work the next day. When they got there, he ordered Bick to get out and follow her. 
Jennifer saw her mom following her and hid in the emergency room waiting area for hours until they left. The next day, her parents called her friend Topaz, who she was supposed to be staying with. Topaz forgot what day it was, slipped up, and told them that Jennifer wasn't there. Jennifer's lies were all coming to a head. When Jennifer got home, her parents confronted her and she reluctantly came clean that she didn't actually work at SickKids and she did not actually graduate from the pharmacology program at the University of Toronto. She also admitted that she had been staying with Daniel. However, she did not disclose that she didn't go to college at all or that she hadn't even graduated from high school. Bick was completely devastated and Han was in an absolute blind rage. At 23 years old, they took her phone and laptop away, had her quit all of her jobs, began tracking all of her movements and tracking the mileage in her car, and forbid her from ever seeing Daniel again. The alternative was that she was banned from the house and completely cut off financially. In 2009, Jennifer posted on her Facebook, living in my house is like living under house arrest. She enrolled in that last calculus class that she had failed so that she could finally graduate from high school. She also snuck around to see Daniel. One night, she stuffed her bed with blankets to make it look like she was sleeping and snuck out to stay with him. Her mother came in to retrieve her wallet and saw that she wasn't there. Han and Bick were furious and told her that she could never see Daniel again. On his end, Daniel had become very weary of the constant drama with her parents and ended their relationship. Jennifer was madly in love with Daniel and was completely heartbroken over their breakup. To make matters worse, she found out shortly after they broke up that Daniel started dating a girl named Christine. In an effort to poison him against his new girlfriend, Jennifer made up a very bizarre story. She told Daniel that three men came to her door flashing police badges and that when she opened the door, they rushed in and all assaulted her. She said that a few days after the assault, she received a bullet in the mail and tried to convince Daniel that they were warnings from Christine to leave Daniel alone. In 2010, Jennifer began talking to an old school friend named Andrew Montemayor. He had allegedly bragged to Jennifer about robbing some people and had confided to her that he had once thought about killing his own father. This sparked an idea in Jennifer's head. By the summer of 2010, Jennifer was back in contact with her ex-boyfriend Daniel and they were flirting daily via text message, even though he was still seriously dating Christine. The evening of November 8, 2010 started off as a normal night at the Pan household. Jennifer sat in her room watching Gossip Girl, Vic went out to her weekly line dancing with friends, and Han watched the news and then headed off to bed around 8.30 p.m. Jennifer's brother Felix was away studying and wasn't home. At 9.30 p.m., Vic came home, changed into her pajamas, and settled in to watch some TV on the main floor. Jennifer came downstairs to tell her mother goodnight and then headed back upstairs. A friend of Jennifer's called her briefly at 10.02 p.m. and three minutes later, Jennifer paused as she thought she heard something downstairs. Three men with guns burst through the front door with one of them shoving a gun in Bick's face. Another man went upstairs and drug Han out of his bed and ordered him downstairs to join his wife. The third man confronted Jennifer in front of her bedroom and tied her hands behind her back. He then took her into her parents' bedroom demanding money. She retrieved $1,100 out of her mom's nightstand and gave it to the gunman. Downstairs, the other two intruders were screaming at Han and demanding more money. When he only had $60, they began still whipping him and Bick began sobbing and begging them not to hurt their daughter. The intruders replied that Jennifer would not be hurt. The upstairs gunman tied Jennifer to the banister and the other two led Han and Bick down into the basement. They covered their heads with blankets and then five shots could be heard. The three intruders were then caught on camera, fleeing out the front door. The following is the 911 call from that night. Where are you, ma'am? Please, oh, ma 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 calm down. Some people broke into our house. Okay, can you show us all this money? Ma 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 where are you? What? Avenue. Avenue Road. Yes. Can you spell the name for me, please? Dad? Oh. Good morning, Mama. I'm calling you. Ma'am. Ma'am. Hello. 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 Yes. Ma'am, I need to know your address. Avenue Road. Can you please sp
tragically, Vic died at the scene, but Han was still alive and rushed to the hospital where he was put into an induced coma. Jennifer was taken down to the police station for questioning. Now I want you to sort of take yourself back to earlier on today, uh, yesterday, meaning uh, the 8th of November, and uh, tell me about your day. Okay, start at any point in time, where, wherever you feel comfortable, and then we're going to move. We're going to move forward. Okay. With all the lights off on the main floor. The only time there was light was when they opened the fridge door to see if they could find where my mom's purse was. I didn't. At that point, I saw three figures of men. One with a hoodie. Like the one I could see the most clearly, he had a hoodie on. And I believe he had a bandana of some sort covering from, like, his lower, uh, under his eyes, down. And then, for some reason, I think one of the, the gentlemen asked my father if he had money in his wallet and where his wallet was. So they took me, because I was next to the stairwell, they took me up the stairs to sh show them where my father's wallet was. But I'm... I didn't know. They had turned the room upside down. I didn't know where his pants were at that time. And then after they had gotten that, they had taken me and they tied me to the top of the banister. Just with one string, I could still move. But I was afraid to because the one guy just had that gun. Just next thing I know, oh, I think I hear my parents going down the stairs, and my mom was asking them for me to come with them. They wouldn't let me come with them. And after they said, the last thing I heard them say was, you lied, you lied to us, you lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. I yelled out for her, and a couple more pops. Take your time. Take your time. And I think I heard my mom say or moan or something, and then they did one more before they left, and then one of the guys said, we have to go now, it's been too long, and then they ran out the door, and I think, once they were out the door, I heard my dad go up the stairs, and at that point, I had my phone in my, po in my, on me, behind me, that I had hidden there that they didn't know about, so when I, when I, when they, when I thought that they had heard them all leave, and my dad ran up the stairs, I whipped up the phone, and I called 911. But I, I still hadn't heard anything from my mom, and all I could hear was my dad running on the street, just moaning and making sounds. During Jennifer's interview, investigators started noticing some very big problems with her story. They asked her to demonstrate how she was able to get to her phone and make the 911 call when her hands were tied behind her back. You're now bound to this, to the, to the railing. Can you show me, can you stand up and turn around and tell me, just show on the camera, how your hands are bound and how you are against the railing. You don't have to sit down, I just need to see how you were. Just tell me. The only reason that I'm trying to, I, I need to do this is that I'm also going to ask you is that it, so take this back to, from, take it out of a traumatizing event, which it is, and pu put yourself into a more clinical position, because I want to see how you could physically get your phone out of your waistband. We're obviously going to need to know that. It's very important. So traumatize a wide way. Now put yourself into a, just a state of, I need to man mechanically show how I can get access to my phone. Okay, because that's obviously very relevant. I, we know you made the phone call, but questions are going to obviously raise is that if my hands are bound and I'm against the railing, how do I talk to a 911 operator? Okay, so clinically, 
This is now a clinical demonstration. Just stand up, focus in on how you did it. And I want you to stick that in your waistband as an example. Okay, so take your just take your sweat off because this will be a very smooth, very quick thing. It's a one-time demonstration. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it, but I need to go through it. Okay, so just take your sweater off. Stand up and turn around. Put this in the side that you believe it was in. Great. Turn around. So that only you're looking away from me. You're looking exactly like now. Here is where the banister is. Put your hands back behind your back, exactly how you remember they were. Okay. Now, and the, are you restrained from movement? How far can you move your hands from the banister? They tied my upper arm. Yes. Around the banister. Yes. But my hands were bound together. So your hands bound together, and this is the arm that's the, the strings wrapped around against the banister. Okay, so now how can you get to the phone? And how do you make the phone call? 911. Mm -hmm. And do you talk down like that? Yes, I'm yelling at the phone like this. And how can you hear? I turn the volume on max. Yes. So that's exactly the way that you're talking to her against the railing. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Sit down. Put your sweater back on. They also wanted to know why there was no forced entry and why the intruder showed no interest in stealing the Pan's luxury vehicles when the keys were sitting right out on the counter. They also wondered why the intruders would let a witness live who could describe them to police. Investigators called Jennifer back the next day and started to dig deeper. They now knew about the web of lies she had told her parents about her academic career and the restrictions that had been placed on her as punishment. Jennifer started to get extremely frustrated and forget the details that she had told the police just 24 hours earlier. You can actually hear the anxiety and frustration in her voice as she trips over her words, realizing that she's contradicting herself from the night before. She even starts to articulate that she's afraid to make statements because she's afraid she's going to say the wrong thing, apparently not aware of how incriminating that statement sounds in itself. In just one of many examples during her interviews, when Jennifer is describing who they refer to as assailant number two, she forgets that she told the detective the night before that he was wearing a hoodie and now says that he was wearing a vest. The detective picks up on it immediately. Continue. I believe he had... I'm sorry, I'm just trying to be 100% certain. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's pieces that I'm... Then roll through them. We'll put the pieces together. Uh, uh, I... You've got the money out of the drawer. Open the drawer. He had He's put it in his pocket. I'm sitting on my bed. Yes. And he had told me to put my hands behind my back. Okay. But it was dark. So I believe he told me to stand up so he could tie my hands together. And I was trying to make it loose so I could, I could do something. But he had pulled him so tight. And he made sure I squealed before he, before he let go. Where are you standing? At first I was standing at the doorway like in the middle of the doorway and then he pushed me aside to my left a little so that number two can come in. Okay. Do you get a good look at number two now of what he's wearing? All I could tell was he had a vest and his face was like a long oval face. He had a vest? No, hoodie. Okay. A dark hoodie. On November 15th, a funeral was held for Bic Pan. Jennifer was in charge of planning the entire thing. Heartbreakingly, Han was unable to attend his own wife's funeral because of his severe injuries. Unbeknownst to Jennifer, investigators now considered her a person of interest and had assigned officers to follow her every move. 
They noted that during her mother's funeral, Jennifer showed no emotion. What Jennifer didn't know was that three days prior on November 12th, her father had miraculously come out of his coma. He had a broken bone near his eye, bullet fragments lodged in his face that doctors could not remove, and a shattered neck bone. They also noted that the bullet had grazed his carotid artery. Not only had Han come out of his coma, but he remembered a lot of what happened that night. Two details in particular were extremely disturbing. Han recalled that he witnessed Jennifer speaking to the intruders in a soft and nice manner, like she was speaking to a friend. He also disputed Jennifer's account of having her hands tied behind her back while she was walking around the house. On November 22nd, the police called Jennifer in for a third interview. However, during this interview, the investigator's tone was completely different. Then of course, um, if you had anything to do with the actual homicide itself, uh, of course you could be charged with murder. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. During the November 22nd interview, investigators bluffed and told Jennifer that they had computer software that could analyze untruths in statements and that there were satellites that used infrared technology to analyze movements inside of buildings. Jennifer took the bait and finally began to confess what really happened. Well, partially confess at least. Jen, you have to help me here. We need that justice for mom now, right? It wasn't supposed to be mommy. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. What about your dad? I wasn't supposed to be that. I wasn't supposed to be me. Okay, why was it supposed to be you? I wasn't ever going to be free from me. <laughs> okay. So, why did it happen this way then? I don't know. Okay, how did they get there? I don't know. You knew they were coming though, right? Because you said it was supposed to be you, right? So what had you done ahead of time to make them come there? What was... What did you tell them to do? Back in the summer of 2010, when Jennifer and Daniel first reconnected, their flirtatious text took a very dark and sinister tone. They began planning Han and Bick's murders so that they could live off of Jennifer's half a million dollar inheritance. Daniel bought Jennifer a burner phone and put her in touch with his friend, Lenford Crawford, who he called Homeboy. Crawford originally quoted Jennifer $20,000 for the job, but later lowered it to $10,000 since she was a friend of Daniel's. They would pay the hitmen $5,000 for each parent. However, Jennifer desperately swore to investigators that she had tried to call it off because she had been getting along with her father in recent months, but that somehow the hitmen got confused. Okay. I need you to listen close to me, okay, Jen? At this point in the investigation, okay, I'm going to be arresting you for murder. Okay? Also attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Do you understand that? Just have to tell me if you understand those charges. Just say yes or no. Yes. Okay. Jennifer was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Daniel Wong and the three hired intruders, David Myvalganem, Eric Carty, and Lemford Crawford, were all arrested in April of 2011. Jennifer, Daniel, and the three intruders were all charged with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. The trial began on March 19, 2014, and stretched on for 10 long months. All five defendants pled not guilty to all charges. During the trial, investigators focused on cell phone data that tracked Jennifer and Daniel's movements, as well as the actual content of their text messages. They also highlighted the inconsistencies in her police interviews, her all-consuming obsession with Daniel Wong, and her own confessions to police. During the trial, Han Pan angrily recalled that Jennifer had been a pathological liar and had milked them for thousands of dollars while pretending to go to college. 
The defense argued that Jennifer had been the victim of abuse for years at the hands of her parents. She also spun a tale for the jury that she had actually tried to call the hit off and had hired the men to kill her and not her parents because doing something to herself would have brought too much shame to the family. Jennifer, Daniel, David, and Lenford were all convicted on December 13, 2014. They all received life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. When the verdict was read, Jennifer again showed no emotion. However, after everyone left the room, she began sobbing and shaking uncontrollably. The fifth defendant, Eric Carty, changed his plea to guilty and was sentenced to 18 years. To this day, it's not 100% clear who actually pulled the trigger on Han and Bick, but investigators believe it was Eric Cardi. Cardi died in his cell in 2018 at 38 years old after being attacked by another inmate. Han and Jennifer's brother Felix requested that the judge grant them a restraining order to prevent Jennifer from ever contacting any of the surviving members of her family. The defense objected to this, saying that Jennifer would be open to speaking to her family in the future. The judge granted their request for the restraining order and also forbid Jennifer from ever speaking to Daniel Wong again. Both Han and Felix gave very emotional victim impact statements during sentencing. Han stated, when I lost my wife, I lost my daughter at the same time. I don't feel like I have a family anymore. Some say I should feel lucky to be alive, but I feel like I am dead too. Felix moved to the East Coast and works for a private tech company. He struggles with depression and anxiety. Addressing his daughter, Han said, I hope my daughter Jennifer thinks about what has happened to her family and can become a good, honest person someday. In May of 2023, the Court of Appeals for Ontario granted an appeal by Jennifer and her three co-conspirators on the first-degree murder charge and ordered a new trial. The appeal was granted on the basis of the judge giving the jury faulty instructions. As of this video, they have not set a date yet for the new trial. So what do you guys think of this case? Do you think Jennifer was just evil? Do you think maybe she was mentally ill, maybe a combination of both? Or do you think there's blame to go around and that Jennifer's parents played a part in anything? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you guys are interested in watching the full interviews between Jennifer and investigators, I have linked them in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe and see you next video.